Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this first of the two sessions on the subject of acceptance something. This uh, session will deal with the concepts which lie at the foundation of acceptance sound. And the next session will deal with actual problems on acceptance sampling. Acceptance sampling uh, is a subject which lie at the confluence of three major knowledge areas, namely quality, risks, and monitoring, evaluation, and control. What is acceptance sampling? Well, the answer to this question lies in another question. Why acceptance sampling? Well, on a project or for that matter, on any production line, a lot of material comes. Do the production managers and project managers straightway start using the material? No, they take the material through quality control tests, whether the material is of the right quality and grade or not. Okay, that being the case, does that mean the entire material is tested? No, it cannot be tested. It is not possible to do that. It involves a lot of effort. And the second point is that some, if not most testing is destructive. So if all the material is lost, then what to use? For instance, if on a building uh, project, if the project manager decides to test all the bricks which are to be used on the project, then all the bricks during the testing process will be destroyed and there will be no bricks left for the project itself. Therefore, we resort to acceptance something. What is acceptance sampling? Acceptance sampling is nothing but taking a random sample out, uh, out of a lot and putting it to tests. If the results are within the acceptance criteria, which has been articulated in the contract, then the sample is accepted. And by that token, the entire lot is accepted. On the contrary, if the test results are outside the acceptance criteria, then the sample is rejected and the lot is rejected. So this is what acceptance sampling is. How is it done? Fairly simply. Let's say this is a particular lot. It is all green. That means, uh, or most of it is green. That means all the items in the lot are good, but then you see some red dots. These red dots indicate defective items. We cannot test the entire lot for the reasons we have already discussed. So what can be done is take a sample, a random sample of an X number of items. Let's say this sample is picked up, random sample from this lot. And this random sample has these red dots, which are the defects or defective items. So let's take those defective items out. Are we ready to accept this lot? Well, we compare it with what the acceptance criteria in the contract says. This is the acceptance criteria in the contract. Here we have three items. The, the acceptance criteria in the contract said no more than two. This is more, this is beyond the acceptance criteria Therefore, this sample is rejected, this sample is rejected, and by that token, uh, this lot is rejected. Let's say if there were two or one here, then this would have been within the acceptance criteria laid down in the contract, and the sample would have been accepted, and the lot would have been accepted. So this is basically the principle of, or this is the how of acceptance sum. Before we proceed further, uh, let's uh, clear up a few thoughts on uh, how the acceptance criteria is articulated. If the acceptance criteria says 
no more than two. It has the same meaning as saying at most two or maximum two or two or less or numerically zero, one and two. No more, no less. If it says no less than two, then it is the same meaning as saying at least two or minimum two or two or more. That means two, three, four, five, all the way to infinity. When we say that a box has 100 balls, some white, others black, and if we say at most two white balls, it has the same meaning as saying at least 98 black balls or maximum two white balls and minimum 98 black balls. So this is how the acceptance criteria is articulated. And while all, uh, on the subject, uh, let's also clear one more term. If an event has 80% chance of happening, then it has 20% chance of not happening. Or if there is an 80% probability of accepting something, then there is a 20% probability of rejecting that thing because rejection and acceptance happening and not happening are complementary to each other. That is when you add them up, it must be one or 100%. So these are the basic uh, concepts uh, on acceptance criteria. One thing more that needs to be cleared, cleared up is the concept of type one and type two errors. Type one error is rejecting something good and type two error is accepting something bad. These two errors have application in all the fields of life. Uh, here are some examples. For instance, rejecting a good lot of project material is making an error, type one error, while accepting a bad lot of project material would be making a type two error. In academia, if an examiner marks a correct answer as incorrect, he is committing a type one error. If an examiner marks an incorrect answer as correct, he is making a type two error. In judiciary, a judge hangs an innocent person. He is making a type one error. A judge acquits a guilty person is making a type two error. In HRM, an organization does not promote or select a competent and deserving person. That organization is making a type one error. An organization promotes and selects an incompetent and undeserving person. That organization is making a type two error. An example from a culture, rejecting a good marriage proposal is making a type one error, but accepting a bad marriage proposal is making a type two error. And of course, there could be tons and tons of other examples. An interesting thing is, while the scholarship has brought out these ideas of type one and type two errors in the last 200 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala articulated these errors for us in his, uh, in his book. Let me refer to you, Surah Bakra, ayat number 216, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrul lakum and perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you. This is type one error, rejecting something good. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْعًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ And perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. You accept something bad. Try to error. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And Allah knows while you know not. How beautifully Qur'an-e Hakeem has defined type one and type two errors for us. These type one and type two errors um, form the basis of what are called risks in acceptance sum. So let us look at these risks. Here is a situation. A consign or consignment of 10,000 bricks is ready at the brick kiln. Brick kiln is butta on in Toka Butta for transportation to the project site. As per the scope, the bricks must clear 1,500 pounds per square inch breaking strength. That means the bricks will be tested. Uh, to, a, to a breaking strength of 1500 PSI. The kill owner has committed that there will be no more than 5% uh, weak bricks in the lot. So 5% of 10,000 is 500. So he has committed, he has guaranteed you that there won't be more than 500 bricks in this lot of 10,000 bricks. The sample acceptance plan calls for subjecting a random 100 brick single sample to the breaking strength. So what you do is, as project manager or as a procurement manager, you go to the lot, pick up a random sample of 100 bricks, and put those 100 bricks to a, a test of breaking strength. The entire lot will be accepted if the number of bricks failing the test is six or less. So in test 100 bricks, and if the failure is six or less, six or less bricks, you accept the sample and you accept the entire lot of 10,000 bricks. However, if the number of bricks that fail the test is seven or more, then the, the sample will be rejected and the entire 10 lot of 10,000 bricks will be rejected. Now let's take two hypothetical cases. First of all, let me introduce you to a few figures here. Uh, this figure here, the one 10,000 bricks is, uh, is the lot size uh, denoted by large, big N. 100. Sample size is denoted by n, so 100 is the sample size. And six or less is referred to as the acceptance level uh, and denoted by small c. Let's now look at two hypothetical cases. Let us say that there are actually 90 defective bricks in the entire lot of 10,000 bricks. The customer, uh, the project manager, doesn't know about it. And most probably, the Bhatta owner would also not know about it. He may have an idea, but he won't know. But one thing we know now is that 90 out of 10,000 10, is 0.9%, which is far, far less than 5%. Uh, or 90 is a figure which is much, much smaller than 500. So this, this uh, lot, uh, which, has, uh, which has been prepared for you, is a good lot. Now you pick up a sample of 100. And it so happens that you go to a place where all those 90 bad bricks are lying. You are picking up a random sample, but because of this randomness, you can go anywhere and you go to a place where all those 90 or let's say most of those 90 bad bricks are lying. 
So you collect the sample of 100. Now, since there are a lot of bad bricks in that sample, which are going to fail the test, it is going to be more than six because we have gone to the place where those 90 bricks are lying. Therefore, you are going to fail the sample and you are not going to accept the lot. So you're going to reject the lot. What lot? Good lot. You are rejecting a good lot. In other words, you are making a type one error. And the probability or, or risk of committing that error, type one error, is referred to as the alpha risk. So we have been introduced now to four terms, the lot size, sample size, acceptance level, uh, type one error, and alpha risk. Let's take the other case, the opposite case. Let us say, there are actually 700 bad bricks in the lot. So this 700 is a figure which is much bigger than 500. So that means this lot of 10,000 bricks is a bad lot. So you now go to select a random sample of 100 bricks. And it so happens that you go to a place where all the good bricks are not. So when you now put this sample of 100 bricks to the test, because you had picked up a sample from, from amongst good bricks, the sample is going to clear the test. And by that token, you're going to accept the lot. Which lot? The bad lot you are accepting a bad lot. You are making a type two error. And the risk of making this type two error is called the beta risk. Sorry, this uh, there's a typo here. It is uh, corrected to 700 defective bricks, not uh, 600. So, uh, we have been now introduced to another term, the beta risk. Acceptance sampling is nothing but an interaction of lot size n, big n, sample size small n, acceptance level c, beta risk, and the earlier alpha risk. It is an interaction, at a very strong interaction uh, between uh, these variables. Plus two more, which we haven't discussed for the timing, but we'll be discussing them soon, which is called, excuse me, AQL and LTPT. So now from acceptance, from, from uh, errors, type one and type two errors, we have progressed to risks, alpha risk and beta risk. And whenever we talk of risks, we cannot avoid discussing probability. Probability is an essential ingredient of a risk. So obviously, if we are talking about alpha and beta risks, we must talk of probabilities. So let's now turn our attention to probability. Consider this. This is a lot of tennis balls, 10,000 tennis balls. All of them are green except some red tennis balls as shown in the diagram. You take out a sample of 100 tennis balls. What is the probability that in that sample of 100 tennis balls, there will not be more than two red balls. In other words, the maximum number of red balls in that sample of 100 is two. They could be two, they could be one, they could be zero. Or 
what is the probability that there will be a minimum of 98 green balls? That means there could be 98, 99, or all the 100. Now, this is not as easy as tossing a coin and saying, what's the probability of getting a head? That is simple probability. Here we are going to deal with compound cumulative probability. But let's start with two considerations first. Let's say there are no red balls at all in this lot. Then what is the probability of finding two red balls in the sample? Of course it is zero because there are no red balls at all in the sample. What is the probability? that there will be one red ball in the, in the lot, uh, in the sample, again zero, because there is no red ball. But what is the probability that there will be no red ball in the sample? 100%, because obviously there is no red ball at all in the lot, in the sample. Therefore, when you pick up the sample of 100 balls, uh, sorry, there's no red ball in the lot. So when you pick up a sample of 100 balls, there is going to be no red ball. So there's 100% probability of zero red ball. 100% probability of zero red ball, 0% probability of one red ball, 0% probability of two red balls. So what is the cumulative possibility? Zero plus zero plus 100, 100%. Now let's take the opposite case. All the balls are red. What is the probability that there will be two red balls? Zero percent, because not two, but all the balls will be red. What will be the probability that there will be one red ball? Again, zero percent by the same argument. What will be the probability that there will be no red balls? Again, zero, because all the balls are red. So what is the cumulative probability? Is zero plus zero plus zero equal to zero. So we have discussed two extreme cases. In the first case, there was no red ball. And what was the probability of finding two or less red balls? 100%. When all the balls were red, what was the probability of finding either two or one or zero red balls? Zero. So as the number of red balls in the lot increased, the probability of finding two or red, less red balls reduced or the probability of adhering to this criteria started diminishing. So this is point number one. Point number two is, of course, which I've already discussed, that is a uh, maximum of two red balls means that we have to find the probability of two red balls, one red ball, and no red ball. What I have given you are the extreme cases, but very simplistic cases dealing with zeros and hundreds. What about intermediate cases? What if there are, let's say, 250 red balls in the lot or 870 red balls in the lot? Then obviously uh, uh, this uh, simplistic approach will not help. For that, we require very complicated formulas, uh, which are shown uh, on the screen. These formulas belong to what are referred to as the binomial distribution and Poisson distribution. There's only a minuscule difference between the results when you apply these formulas. The difference is negligible. However, we are going to confine ourselves to uh, Poisson distribution. This distribution is named after Monsieur Simeon Poisson, who was a French uh, mathematician, and he came up with this distribution, and it's therefore it is named. So what is this distribution? This distribution tells us that the probability of finding an X number of results, that is two red balls, will be, just forget about the summation for the time being, will be, e raised to the power minus n t. What is e? e is called the exponential constant. And it is also uh, referred to as the Euler 
number, uh, the gentleman, the mathematician uh, who founded Earth. Its value is 2.72, correct to two decimal places, otherwise it goes to, uh, as many, uh, it goes to infinity in decimal places. N is nothing but the sample size, which in this case is 100. P is proportional defectives. In other words, it is quality. How many defectives are there in the sample? That is denoted by P. And this product is again over here. And X is nothing but your acceptance level, which we talked uh, previously, acceptance level. So in this case, acceptance level is two. That means it could be two, it could be one, it could be zero. Now let's look at the summation sign of uh, the capital sigma. It tells us that we have to sum up. If the quantities are more than one, we have to sum up all the quantities. In this case, x is equal to two. So we apply this formula first for x is equal to two, then apply it for x is equal to one, and then apply for x is equal to zero, and then sum it all. That is what is meant by sigma. This product is also referred to as lambda or the Poisson mean. This, in very, we are going to discuss that, but this in very simple terms means that if there are 4% defectives in a lot and you pick up a sample of 150, so how many defectives do you expect in that sample of 150? If there are four in 100, then in 150, it would be obviously six. How do we find out? We find out by multiplying 150, and what is 150? N. And P, P is proportional defect. What is proportional defect is in this case four. So 4% 4 multiplied by 150 is equal to six. So this is referred to as Poisson mean, uh, or lambda. Now, if we look at this formula again, we find that it has only two variables. One variable is the lambda, lambda here and lambda here. This is a constant. So this lambda here, lambda here, and the second variable is the acceptance level, which is x. You don't have to remember this formula, nor you have to apply this formula because this formula has already been calculated for different values of lambda and x in the form of what is that, what is called the Poisson tables. We use Poisson tables in acceptance sampling, although we could also use this formula. But just to develop your trust in the Poisson tables, what I'm going to do is do a few calculations, first on the calculator and then cross-check cross-check check them with uh, the Poisson tables. So let's do these uh, calculations. Here is one example. A lot of some project material has 4% defective items. And a sample of 150 items is picked up. So that is the state. What are the questions, four questions? How many defectives are expected in the sample of 150? In 100, there are four, so how many in 150? What is the probability that the sample will have exactly two defective items? Exactly two. What is the probability that the sample will have no more than two defective items? That means there could be two, there could be one, and there could be no. And then, if the quality deteriorates from 150, from 4% to 6%, what is the probability that the sample will have no more than two defective items? Okay, let's do a little number crunch. In the first case, N is equal to 150. P is 4% defective items. So what is uh, lambda, uh, what is 
the number of defectives in 150, all we have to do is multiply 150 with B, the percentage, and we get six. And this is nothing but N multiplied by P, therefore it is lambda. So our Poisson mean is six, which is the number of defective items in the sample of 150. The next question is, what is the probability that the sample will have exactly two defective items? We have to apply the Poisson formula. What we have to do is, this constant, the exponential constant raised to the power of negative lambda. We have already found lambda, it is six. Then take the lambda and take its square. Not square, raise, raise it to the power of acceptance level. What is the acceptance level over here? Two. If it was three here, we would raise it to three. If it was four here, we would raise it to four. Two. And then factorial of the acceptance level, two. If it was three here, we would take three. If it was four here, we would take four. This and this is always the same. And we come to this result. Now let me do this on the calculator. Uh, for this, I'm afraid I have to shift uh, screen. Uh, let me have to, I have to get rid of this, then bring up my calculator and then share new screen, which is this one here. And I think we are good for going on. Okay, I can get rid of this. Okay. Let it lie low. So I'm going to do now in front of you the same calculation using this formula. Well, on this, you have to have a scientific calculator to do this. Okay. First of all, exponential constant raised to the power minus six. On these calculators, you will find exponential, uh, exponential constant as the supplementary uh, function under the button natural log, which is ln. So here we are, ex. But it is colored uh, brown, so we have to press shift first. Shift, ln, and we get, uh, we get the exponent, uh, we get the e raised to the power lambda. What lambda we have found? We have found it six. So minus six close bracket, then multiplied by lambda square, lambda not square, lambda raised to the power two, lambda raised to the power acceptance there. So multiplied by lambda is six raised to the power two, and then divided by two factorial, here is two, and factorial on scientific calculators is the secondary function on this button. Again, this is brown, so we press shift first and then go for factorial, hit equal to, and we get a figure of 0 0.0446, which is the same as this one here. So the probability of finding exactly two defectives in the sample size of 150 is 0 0.446 or 4.46%. Let's deal with the next question. What is the probability that the sample will have no more than two defective items? No more than two. That means now we have to find the probability of two defective items, one defective item, and zero defective item, and that's where that sigma came in. So in, over there, instead of writing this series, they just put it the sigma sign and then saying that sum up all the, uh, all the answers uh, for all the values of x. We have already found the value of two, so that is two. This is the value of, for prob this is the probability of one defective, and this is the probability of zero defective. And you sum it up, it comes to this. 
Well, uh, this will be tedious doing it this way. So let's use the calculator and uh, do it uh, in an easier way. Let's get rid of this calculation. We know that this is uh, common to all. So we'll take this outside the packet and then just sum up six raised to the power two upon two factorial plus six raised to the power one plus one factorial, etc. cetera. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, first, we enter e raised to the power minus six, shift e raised to the power minus six, close bracket. And now we have, we will put everything else in the bracket. First, we will put six raised to the power two, six raised to the power two divided by two factorial, so shift one. So we have dealt with probability of two. Add, add, this time, six raised to the, we are talking about now probability of one. So six raised to the power one, because six raised to the power one is six, so we don't need to enter the power uh, unless you want to. Okay, let me do it. Six raised to the power one. Okay, I think this will be better if we do it. Divided by one factorial. One factorial is one, but again, let's actually do it. One shift factorial. So we have done it for one. And finally for zero, six raised to the power zero close bracket divided by zero factorial. Zero factorial is one, but again, we let the computer do it, calculator do it here. And now we close the main bracket, hit equal to, and we should get this answer. There we are. So we get the same answer, 6196880442. Now let's get rid of the calculator and see whether we get the same result using the Poisson tables. So let me get rid of this calculator. We don't need it anymore. Uh, let's by the way, uh, correct it to three significant figures. So this uh, to three significant figures becomes uh, 062. Why three significant figures? Because the Poisson tables, uh, which I have shared, shared with you, as part of your course material is correct to three significant figures. Okay, I have to shift the screen again. Uh, remember this. Uh, remember two things. Uh, the arguments which we enter into Poisson tables are two. Number one, lambda. Lambda we have found out to be six. And the second is acceptance level. Acceptance level in this case is two. So we will enter person tables with six and two, and let's see how, so let me uh, change the screen. Here are the Poisson tables. Let me share them with you. This is what Poisson tables look like. In the first column, in the first column, we have uh, the lambdas. That is the product of N and P, which in this case was six. So we will enter this person table at six. And these are your acceptance levels, zero, one, two, in our case, it was two. So we are going to look in this column, two, in front of a lambda of six. Please remember that two means the third column. So we will look in the third column against lambda six. So let's go down, here we are, six. And in the third column, we find a probability of this, 0.062, which is the same which we had worked on. So let's go back to the previous screen. Here we are, 0.62. So this is how we use the Poisson tables. Let's deal with the last question now, if the quality deteriorates to 6% effectives from 4% effectives, what is the probability that the sample will have no more than two defective factors? Okay. 
if you recall, when the number of red balls increased in the sample, in the lot, the probability reduced. Let's see if that is the case here also. What has changed in this case is P. P has changed from four to six percent. So now we have to find out the new lambda. And the new lambda in this case would be N is 150, P is 6%, so it becomes 9. We have to find the probability with this new lambda, probability of 2, probability of 1, probability of 0. I have done it already for you. This is the figure, and it is 0 0.06. Let's cross-check with Poisson table. So let me shift the screen again. Remember, we have to enter now the Poisson tables at lambda is equal to 9 whereas C stays the same. So let's shift the screen again. Okay, we have to now look for N is, uh, lambda is equal to nine. So go down, down, and slightly down. And here we are nine, under two, we get a figure of 0 0.006. 0 0.006, let's go back to our previous screen. And as you can see, it is 0 0.006. So we can draw some very important conclusions. What are those conclusions? As the quality deteriorated from 4% to 6%, what happened to lambda? Lambda increased from six to nine. This is point number one. Again, when the quality deteriorated from four to nine, four to six percent, the probability of accept the prob the, the, the the criteria the, the selection criteria that is two defective items or less it reduced 10 times from 0 0.062 to 0 0.066, which again is in conformity with the example of tennis balls, which we did earlier, that as the number of red tennis balls increased in the sample, in the lot, then restricting the number of red balls or the probability of restricting the red balls to two or less in the sample reduced to, the, to an extent then when all the balls became red, the probability reduced to zero and it is absolutely in conformity with that. So we come to these two conclusions, which says that increasing value of lambda is the sign of deteriorating quality and deteriorating quality leads to diminishing probability of meeting the criteria. So these are two free results, uh, which we are now going to use in building up the further concept of acceptance sound. Let's now do that. We are going to look at various quality levels and what probability we are going to get for finding particular a selection criteria. Okay, let's go. Let's take the same example again. The tennis balls with few red tennis balls. So here, what we're going to do is look at quality level in deteriorating order. That means from 0% effectives to uh, let's say 10% effectives, and uh, you will agree that any quality level which is less than 10% is hardly any quality. It is an apology of a quality. So we are going to list quality levels here from zero to 10%. Then we are going to find the probability of finding two red balls, one red ball and no red ball, just like we did in that example, probability of finding two defectives, one defective and nil defective. And in the last column, 
we are going to cumulate all the three probabilities. That means this will be equal to this probability plus this probability plus this probability. I have already pre-calculated just to save on time, and these are the results. And as you can see, and as would be expected, as the quality deteriorates, from goes from zero to 10%, the probability of finding two or less red balls decreases. Uh, just to reassure you, let's take any figure. Let's take 5%, uh, for 500. 500 is 5%, I have already calculated here because 500 divided by 10,000 is 5%. So our NP is five. Let's enter the Poisson tables at NP is equal to five. And let's see if we do get a result of 0.125. So let me change the screens again. Poisson table. And let's find five. Here we are. Five. NP is equal to five. And under two, what do we get? One to five, point one to five. And let's go back to our screen now. Here we are, the same, 0.125. As a next step, what I'm going to do is do a chart of all this to make some sense out of it. So what I'm going to do is plot the quality levels or the number of reds in the, in the, uh, in the lot, 0% red, 1% red, 2% red, and the probability of finding two or less reds in the sample. So I'm going to plot these two as a chart. Here we go. So the same, I put the same data over here. And what I'm going to do now is plot them on a chart. I'll put the num percentage of red balls on the horizontal axis, left to right, zero to 10%. That means no red balls in the lot and 10% red balls in the lot. And this is the probability uh, uh, scale for plotting this. And when we plot, this is the figure we get. This figure is like a seal or like a, a sea line, where this is the mouth of the sea line, uh, this is its main body, and this is the, uh, this is the uh, bottom half or the tail of the sea line. And this is the curve we get. This is called the probability curve. What does it mean? It means, again, if we have 5% red balls in the lot, then the probability of finding two or less red balls in the sample is 12.5% or 1.125. Now I'm going to make a very strong analogy here. And if you have understood the previous concept, this analogy is going to be, uh, it is going to make uh, absolute sense to you. But if you think this analogy is not making any sense to you, then I would suggest stop the video here and go back and restart. So here is the analogy. What if this is not a lot of tennis balls, it is a lot of some project material. And these green tennis balls represent good items, non-defective items. And the red tennis balls represent defective items. Also, when, when you say that no more than two red balls, it means no more than two defective items. Two defective items where? In the sample. In the sample of how many? Of 100. So this is 
So all of a sudden we now have, we now translate this probability curve into something very unusual. What has happened now that instead of this being the percentage of red balls in the lot, this has become the quality level. The quality of production where the production has 0% defective, 1% defective, 2% and so on and so forth. And this is not the probability of finding two red balls now. This is the probability of finding, of finding two or less defectives. And if that is your acceptance criteria, that means you will accept the sample and the lot. If you do find two or less defectives, then this becomes your probability of acceptance. Probability of accepting the sample and by same token, the probability of accepting the lot. This is explained over here. So our probability curve has now converted into what is known as the operating characteristics curve, that means OC curve. So all of a sudden the perspective has changed from a probability to acceptance sample. Let's explore this curve in a little more detail. So this is the same curve. What additionally I've done is put up a color scale over here, going from green, blending into red. Green means good lot, because it is 0%, 1%, and it is gradually tapering into the red zone and getting to the extreme bad uh, limit of 10%. Anything beyond 10% is meaningless. In any case, you find this, uh, uh, this curve hitting the floor. Uh, that means 0% after about 10%. So it is meaningless to go after getting quality out, which is less than 10%. Also, for the sake of comparison, I have put up a little chart over here for the sigma values. Uh, what do two sigma means? Two sigma means there could be 4.5% defectives uh, in the lot. Three sigma, as we know, is 0.3%. In fact, it is 0.297, but we take it at 0.3%, which means essentially about three defective items in a lot of 1,000. So this is three sigma. Let us say you are the seller or you are the producer and you have produced at a quality level of 2%. What is 2%? If you look at this, graph, uh, this chart, 2% will equate somewhere, let's say 2.3, 2.2 sigma. So you are manufacturing at 2.2, 2.3 sigma. If you do that, what is the probability that your sample and the lot will be accepted? As we can see, this 2% is hitting the OC curve here at 0.68. So there is 68% probability that your items will clear the validate scope process, which the customer will do by his quality control team. So the probability of acceptance is 68%. If 68% is the probability of acceptance, then what is the probability of rejection? It has to be complementary. And complementary of 68% is 38, 32%. One minus 68% or 100 minus 68% is 32%. So whereas this this column from zero all the way to 68% represents acceptance. This column from 68% to 100% represents rejection. 
So there is a 32% chance of rejection. Rejection. What will you be rejecting? You will be rejecting something good. It is in the green zone. And what is rejecting something good called? Type one error. And the risk associated with type one error is alpha risk. So we say the alpha risk in this case is 32% or 0.32. I would suggest that you always express risk uh, and uh, the quality in terms of a percentage and probability not in percentage so that we can differentiate. So the risk of rejection, if you are manufacturing at 2% is 32%. It is not. That means every, uh, every one item out of three would be rejected. It is a heavy rejection. Can you afford it? What does your OPA say? Your, what does your company policy say? How much risk you should accept that your good lot will be rejected by the customer? Well, let's say your OPA says 5%, no more than 5%. Uh, 5%. It looks like easier said than done because this 5% now, if you hit the OC curve with 5% and come down, it gives you a quality level of 0.75%. That means you should be manufacturing at 0.75% defectives. And if you look at this chart, you should be manufacturing at about 2.7 sigma. You were previously manufacturing at 2.2, 2.3 sigma and you have to improve your production to 2.7 sigma. So this quality level, which corresponds to your alpha risk threshold as defined in your OPAs, is referred to as AQL or the acceptance quality level. This was talking about the good lot. Let's turn our attention to the bad lot. Let us say the seller is producing at 4.5%. So 4.5% translates to an acceptance probability of 12.5% or 12.5. Accept, accepting, accepting what? Accepting something bad. And what is accepting something bad known as? Type two risk, type two error. And what risk is associated with type two error? Beta risk. So from the floor to 17% or 0.17 is the beta risk. This is beta risk. So we find that whereas alpha risk is from the probability to the top, beta risk is from the probability to the bottom, to the floor. Again, you look, you are now buyer. You look at your OPAs as to what your threshold is for beta risk. That is the risk that you will accept something bad. You will accept a bad law and you find that that risk is 10%. So just like we hit the OC curve with our threshold over here, we'll do the same thing over here, 10%, we hit it, enter with 10%, hit the curve, come down, we get a quality level of 0.3%. And this is referred to as RQL, rejection quality level. This was acceptance quality level, this is rejection quality level, and this has another name, the LTPD, or the lot tolerance proportional defectives. All this is transcripted on this slide. And on this one slide, 
you have the entire concept of acceptance sampling explained. Uh, you, you will find the same handout in your notes as part of the course material I have given you. So between the course notes and this video, you should be able to nail this, uh, these concepts of acceptance sampling. Let me now come to the final slide, uh, which is a summary of what we have discussed in this session. We have discussed a number of things. Alpha risk, beta risk, type one error, type two error, seller, buyer, AQL, LTP. So basically we are getting two categories of quote unquote data. Why quote unquote data? Because this, all of it may not fall into the category of data, but loosely speaking, it is data. These two be, these may be two different categories, but these are not independent categories. They are highly interdependent. Rather, they are conjoined, like Siamese twins. They are flip sides of the same coin. One cannot exist without the other. I have done a question answer exercise here just to make the concept a little more clear to you. For example, in whatever we have discussed so far, who are the people we are talking about? Well, we are talking about seller on one hand and the buyer on the other hand. And the seller has other names, supplier, contractor, producer, factory, plant. It could be a person, uh, it could be a non-person, physical entity. Likewise, we have, a, we have other names for the buyer also, project manager, procurement manager, customer, consumer, etc. Okay, what type of risk these people take? The seller takes alpha risk and the buyer takes beta risk. Okay, what is the risk? The risk is, for this gentleman, the seller, the risk is that the buyer will reject his, that is seller's good lot. And what is his risk? His risk is that he will accept a bad lot from the seller in the validate scope process. Why should that happen? Well, it happens because the buyer makes two errors. In this case, he makes a type one error. And in this case, he makes a type two error. But both errors are made by the buyer. Okay. What is the basis of calculating this risk, alpha risk and beta risk? Well, in case of alpha risk, it is the probability of rejecting seller's good lot. And in case of this risk, the basis of risk is probability of accepting the seller's bad lot. Okay, what quality levels are associated with these risks? AQL, acceptance or acceptable quality level is associated with alpha risk and RQL, rejection quality level or lot tolerance proportional defective level is associated with beta risk. Uh, this brings us uh, to the end of part one. I do hope you have hacked these concepts and if indeed you have hacked them, you will find part two, which is on actual problems, just as a piece of cake. It will be very easy for you. On that note, thank you for joining and Allah.